ministers must arouse and manifest a life, zeal, and devotion to which they have for quite a length of time been almost strangers because they have failed to walk with God. The cause of God in many places is not improving. Soul work is needed. The people are overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. They are entering deeper and deeper into a spirit of worldly enterprise. They are ambitious to gain. Spirituality and devotion are rare. The spirit that prevails is to work, to accumulate, and to add to that which they already possess. What will be the end of these things, was the burden of my inquiry. Conference meetings have accomplished no lasting good. Those who attend the meetings carry a spirit of traffic with them. Ministers and people frequently bring their merchandise to these large gatherings, and the truths spoken from the desk fail to impress the heart. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, fails to do its office work. It falls tamely upon the hearers. The exalted work of God is made to connect too closely with common things. The ministers must be converted before they can strengthen their brethren. They should not preach themselves, but Christ and His righteousness. A reformation is needed among the people, but it should first begin its purifying work with the ministers. They are watchmen upon the walls of Zion to sound the note of warning to the careless, the unsuspecting, also to portray the fate of the hypocrite in Zion. It seemed to me that some of the ministers had forgotten that Satan was yet alive, as persevering, earnest, and artful as ever, that he was still seeking to allure souls from the path of righteousness. One important part of the work of the ministry is to faithfully present to the people the health reform as it stands connected with the third angel's message as part and parcel of the same work. They should not fail to adopt it themselves and should urge it upon all who profess to believe the truth. Ministers should have no separate interest aside from the great work of leading souls to the truth. Their energies are all needed here. They should not engage in merchandise, in peddling, or in any business aside from this one great work. The solemn charge given to Timothy rests with equal weight upon them laying upon them the most solemn obligations and most fearful responsibilities. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Wrong habits of life have lessened our mental and physical sensibilities, and all the strength we can acquire by right living and placing ourselves in the best relation to health and life should be devoted unreservedly to the work which God has assigned us. We cannot afford to use the few enfeebled, crippled energies which we possess to serve tables or to mingle merchandise with the work God has committed to us. Every faculty of mind and body is now needed. The work of God requires this, and no separate business can be engaged in aside from this great work without taking time and strength of mind and body and thus lessening the vigor and force of our labor in the cause of God. Ministers who do this will not have all that time for meditation and prayer, and all that strength and clearness of mind that they should have to understand the cases of those who need help and to be prepared to be instant in season, out of season. A word fitly spoken at the right time may save some poor, erring, doubting, fainting soul. Paul exhorted Timothy, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. In Christ's commission to his disciples, he tells them, 
Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. If this is the fearfully responsible work of God's ministers, how important that they give themselves wholly to it and watch for souls as they that must give an account. Should any separate or selfish interest come in here and divide the heart from the work? Some ministers linger about their homes and run out on the Sabbath and then return and exhaust their energies in farming or in attending to home matters. They labor for themselves through the week and then spend the remnant of their exhausted energies in laboring for God. But such feeble efforts are not acceptable to him. They have no mental or physical strength to spare. At best, their efforts are feeble enough. But after they have been engrossed and entangled all through the laboring days of the week with the cares and perplexities of this life, they are wholly unfitted for the high, the sacred, the important work of God. The destiny of souls hangs upon the course they pursue and the decisions they make. How important, then, that they should be temperate in all things, not only in their eating, but in their labor, that their strength may be unabated and devoted to their sacred calling. A great mistake has been made by some who profess present truth by introducing merchandise in the course of a series of meetings and by their traffic diverting minds from the object of the meetings. If Christ were now upon earth, he would drive out these peddlers and traffickers, whether they be ministers or people, with a scourge of small cords as when he entered the temple anciently and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. These traffickers might have pleaded as an excuse that the articles they held for sale were for sacrificial offerings, but their object was to get gain, to obtain means, to accumulate. I was shown that if the moral and intellectual faculties had not been clouded by wrong habits of living, Ministers and people would have been quick to discern the evil results of mixing sacred and common things. Ministers have stood in the desk and preached a most solemn discourse, and then by introducing merchandise and acting the part of a salesman, even in the house of God, they have diverted the minds of their hearers from the impressions received and destroyed the fruit of their labor. If the sensibilities had not been blunted, they would have had discernment to know that they were bringing sacred things down upon a level with common. The burden of selling our publications should not rest upon ministers who labor in word and doctrine. Their time and strength should be held in reserve that their efforts may be thorough in a series of meetings. Their time and strength should not be drawn upon to sell our books when they can be properly brought before the public by those who have not the burden of preaching the word. In entering new fields, it may be necessary for the minister to take publications with him to offer for sale to the people, and it may be necessary in some other circumstances also to sell books and transact business for the office of publication. But such work should be avoided whenever it can be done by others. Ministers have all that they ought to do to preach the word, and after they have urged solemn truth upon the people, they should maintain a humble dignity as the preachers of exalted truth and as representatives of the truth presented to the people. After their labored effort, they need rest, even selling books upon present truth is a care, a tax to the mind, and a weariness to the body. If there are those who still have a reserve force and can be taxed without injury to themselves, there is important work for them to do, and it has but just commenced when they have spoken the truth to the people. Then come the exemplary preaching, the watchful care, the seeking to do good to others, the conversation, 
and visiting at the fireside from house to house, entering into the condition of mind and the spiritual state of those who listen to the discourse from their lips, exhorting this one, reproving that one, rebuking another, and comforting the afflicted, suffering, and desponding. The mind should be as free from weariness as possible that they may be minute men, instant in season, out of season. They should obey the injunction given by Paul to Timothy, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them. The responsibility of the work rests very lightly upon some. They feel that after they leave the desk their work is done. It is a burden to visit, a burden to talk, and the people who are really desirous of getting all the good there is for them and who wish to hear and learn that they may see all things clearly are not benefited and satisfied. Ministers excuse themselves because they are weary, and yet some exhaust their precious strength and spend their time in work which another could do just as well as they. They should preserve moral and physical vigor that as faithful workmen of God they may give full proof of their ministry. In every important place there should be a depository for publications. And someone who really appreciates the truth should manifest an interest to get these books into the hands of all who will read. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few and the few experienced laborers now in the field have all they should do to labor in word and doctrine. Men will arise who claim that God has laid upon them the burden of teaching the truth to others. All such should be proved and tried. They should not be relieved from all care, neither should they be lifted into responsible positions at once, but they should be encouraged, if they deserve encouragement, to give full proof of their ministry. It would not be the best course for such ones to pursue to enter into other men's labors. Let them first labor in connection with one of experience and wisdom, and he can soon see whether they are capable of exerting an influence that will be saving. Young preachers who have never had wearing and wearing labor, nor felt the draft upon their mental and physical strength, should not be encouraged to hope for a support independent of their own physical labor, for this will only injure them and will be a bait to entice men to engage in the work who realize nothing of the burden of it or the responsibility resting upon God's chosen ministers. Such will feel competent to teach others when they have scarcely learned the first principles themselves. Many who profess the truth are not sanctified by it, and are not endowed with wisdom. They are not led and taught of God. God's people, as a general thing, are worldly-minded and have departed from the simplicity of the gospel. This is the cause of the great lack of spiritual discernment in the course they have pursued toward ministers. If a minister preaches with freedom, some will praise him to his face. Instead of dwelling upon the truths he uttered and improving upon them, thus showing themselves to be not forgetful hearers but doers of the work, they exalt him by referring to what he has done. They dwell upon the virtues of the poor instrument, but forget Christ who employed the instrument. Ever since the fall of Satan, who was once an exalted angel in glory, Ministers have fallen through exaltation. Unwise Sabbath keepers have pleased the devil well by praising their ministers. Were they aware that they were aiding Satan in his work? They would have been alarmed had they realized what they were doing. They were blinded. They were not standing in the counsel of God. I lift my voice of warning against praising or flattering the ministers. I have seen the evil, the dreadful evil of this. Never, never speak a word in praise of ministers to their faces. Exalt God. Ever respect a faithful minister, realize his burdens and lighten them if you can, but do not flatter him, for Satan stands ready at his watchtower to do that kind of work himself. 
Ministers should not use flattery or be respecter of persons. There ever has been and still is great danger of erring here, of making a little difference with the wealthy, or flattering them by special attention, if not by words. There is danger of having men's persons in admiration for the sake of gain, but in doing this their eternal interests are endangered. The minister may be the special favorite of some wealthy man, and he may be very liberal with him. This gratifies the minister, and he in turn lavishes praise upon the benevolence of his donor. His name may be exalted by appearing in print, and yet that liberal donor may be entirely unworthy of the credit given him. His liberality did not arise from a deep, living principle to do good with his means, to advance the cause of God because he appreciated it, but from some selfish motive, a desire to be thought liberal. He may have given from impulse, and his liberality have no depth of principle. He may have been moved upon by listening to stirring truth which for the time being loosed his purse strings. Yet, after all, his liberality has no deeper motive. He gives by spasms. His purse opens spasmodically and closes just as securely spasmodically. He deserves no commendation, for he is in every sense of the word a stingy man, and unless thoroughly converted, purse and all, will hear the withering denunciation, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Such will awake at last from a horrible self-deception. Those who praised their spasmodic liberalities helped Satan to deceive them and make them think that they were very liberal, very sacrificing, when they knew not the first principles of liberality or self-sacrifice. Some men and women make themselves believe that they do not consider the things of this world of much value, but prize the truth and its advancement higher than any worldly gain. Many will awake at last to find that they have been deceived. They may have once appreciated the truth, and earthly treasures in comparison with truth may have appeared to them valueless. But after a time, as their worldly treasure increased, they became less devotional. Although they have enough for a comfortable sustenance, yet all their acts show that they are in no wise satisfied. Their works testify that their hearts are bound up in their earthly treasure. Gain, gain is their watchword. To this end, every member of the family participates in their labor. They give themselves scarcely any time for devotion or for prayer. They work early and late. Sickly, diseased women and feeble children whip up their flagging ambition and use up the vitality and strength they have to reach an object, to gain a little, make a little more money. They flatter themselves that they are doing this, that they may help the cause of God. Terrible deception! Satan looks on and laughs, for he knows that they are selling soul and body through their lust for gain. They are continually making flimsy excuses for thus selling themselves for gain. They are blinded by the God of this world. Christ has bought them by his own blood. But they rob Christ, rob God, tear themselves to pieces, and are almost useless in society. They devote but little time to the improvement of the mind, and but little time to social or domestic enjoyment. They are of but little benefit to anyone. Their lives are a terrible mistake. Those who thus abuse themselves feel that their course of unremitting labor is praiseworthy. They are destroying themselves by their presumptuous labor. They are marring the temple of God by continually violating the laws of their being through excessive labor, and yet they think it is a virtue. When God calls them to account, when He requires of them the talents He has lent them with usury, what can they say? 
what excuse can they make? Were they heathen who knew nothing of the living God and in their blind idolatrous zeal throw themselves under the car of Juggernaut, their cases would be more tolerable. But they had the light. They had warning upon warning to preserve their bodies, which God calls his temple, in as healthy a condition as possible that they might glorify him in their bodies and spirits, which are his. The teachings of Christ they disregarded. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. They let worldly cares entangle them. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. They worship their earthly treasure, as the ignorant heathen does his idols. Many flatter themselves that their desire for gain is that they may help the cause of God. Some promise that when they have gained such an amount, then they will do good with it and advance the cause of present truth. But when they have realized their expectations, they are no more ready to help the cause than before. They again pledge themselves that after they purchase that desirable house or piece of land and pay for it, then they will do a great deal with their means to advance the work of God. But as the desire of their heart is attained, they have far less disposition than in the days of their poverty to aid in the advancement of the work of God. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfaithful and unfruitful. The deceitfulness of riches leads them on step by step, until they lose all love for the truth, and yet they flatter themselves that they believe it. They love the world and the things of the world, but the love of God or of the truth is not in them. In order to gain a little money, many deliberately arrange their business matters so that it necessarily brings a great amount of hard work upon those laboring out of doors and upon their families in the house. The bone, muscle, and brain of all are taxed to the utmost. A great amount of work is before them to be done, and the excuse is they must accomplish just all that they possibly can or there will be a loss. Something will be wasted. Everything must be saved. Let the result be what it may. What have such gained? Perhaps they have been able to keep the principal good and add to it. But on the other hand, what have they lost? Their capital of health, which is invaluable to the poor as well as the rich, has been steadily diminishing. The mother and the children have made repeated drafts upon their fund of health and strength, thinking that such an extravagant expenditure would never exhaust their capital until they are surprised at last to find their vigor of life exhausted. They have nothing left to draw upon in case of emergency. The sweetness and happiness of life is embittered by racking pains and sleepless nights. Both physical and mental vigor are gone. The husband and father, who, for the sake of gain, made the unwise arrangement of his business, and it may be with the full sanction of the wife and mother, and may, as a result, bury the mother and one or more of the children. Health and life were sacrificed for the love of money. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There is a great work to be accomplished for Sabbath keepers. Their eyes must be opened, and they see their true condition, and be zealous and repent, or they will fail of everlasting life. 
The spirit of the world has taken possession of them, and they are brought into captivity by the powers of darkness. They do not heed the exhortation of the Apostle Paul. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. With many, a worldly spirit with covetousness and selfishness predominates. Those who possess it are looking out for their own special interest. The selfish rich man does not interest himself in the things of his neighbors unless it be to study how he can advantage himself at their disadvantage. The noble and godlike in man is parted with, sacrificed for selfish interests. The love of money is the root of all evil. It blinds the vision and prevents people from discerning their obligations to God or to their neighbors.